A professor at Polk State College started a musical movement within the community with his Voices of the People series. Over the years, it's morphed and transformed into many different sounds. And the latest show is going to be something that you don't want to miss. And all the details are coming up next on Polk Place. Hello and welcome to Polk Place. I'm your host, Brian Lacey. And joining me in studio, a longtime friend of mine, uh, did a recording with me uh, for Polk Place some years ago. I think yeah. it was on first series, Voices of the People. Absolutely, yes. yes. Derek mentioned he is a uh, professor at Polk State College, but most of all, he's a damn fine musician. Thank you. Thank you, man. <laughs> always a pleasure here. to see you. And I got to tell you, man, I'm not a real big fan of Facebook, but I always <laughs> check out what you're doing. Oh, man, thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> that makes me feel good. Man. My time's not being wasted. Cool, cool. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about y your background. Sure. Uh, talk about what you do for uh, Polk State College. So I'm a humanities professor, and um, I teach uh, some private lessons out there on string instruments, teach uh, uh, world mythology. It's a lot of fun because the humanities are the arts. That works well for me because I do a few different things. Uh, I think uh, being from Polk County, being from Winter Haven, most people know of me as a cellist and now for 15 years being a professor at Polk State. But I'm also a, a visual artist, a bit of a writer. I do a whole bunch of different things. So the humanities is a great academic scholastic place for me to park because I can sort of speak from my different heads, as it were, about different arts. I I'm, I'm love teaching the humanities, and that's what I do. And, and of course, I've invented you know, Voices of the People for Polk State. As we said in the, in the intro, and you just said, Voices of the People yeah. uh, started, what was that, about six years ago? Two th yeah, yeah, great, 2012, 2012, yeah. yeah. So, um, and as we said, it's kind of went through some changes, and, sure. and yet you continue to play. Talk about how Voices of the People came about. Wow, a, a great uh, a boon to Polk State, a guy named Melvin Thompson, who runs the uh, Student Activities and Leadership Organization, came to me after I had done a, a series of uh, annual cello recitals where I'd bring uh, a great pianist in to accompany me in just full recitals. I said, Derek, you know, I know that you could do a music festival the likes of Florida State or even larger. Uh, would you want to put that together? I said, if you can find me the dollars, I can put together anything you want. When it comes to the arts or music, I can put together anything you want. So he said, you know, I've greenlit you, put a, put a, put a series together. And uh, I think we're, he came to me probably in May at the end of a semester, uh, end of the school year actually, and over the summer. I may or may not have taught, but I got together a roster of musicians, I got together a theme, and when fall came, I had a whole package. And uh, that's how Voices of the People began. So it literally was me doing uh, solo recitals and inviting a, a lone friend every now and then to, to, to play with me. And uh, Melvin and my provost, Steve Hull, uh, uh, knowing what I did and knowing of my track record in the classroom, they fortunately liked what I did and my results. And they said, you know, put this together if you don't mind, and I did. And, uh, I'll never forget, uh, the provost, uh, Steve, said, you know, it may not work. Maybe you'll get two people in the audience, but we trust you and uh, we're going to support you. And then after he saw 200 people in the audience at our first at our inaugural concert, I'll never forget the biggest compliment I've ever been paid. He went to Melvin and said, that was money well spent. Make sure you support him again. And we've been off and running since then. You know? So some six years later, yeah. and as with any musician that plays out and about, um, yeah. The friends list goes larger. It does. And it does. outside of Polk County. Yeah. And now we have the new project. And, and yeah. wow, I'm even excited. Good, good, good. That's talk what we to me, want. Talk to me a little bit about this project. So Voices of the People has predominantly been a vehicle for chamber music, right? We've talked about that. Music that was written centuries ago for small rooms, a little bit, well, a lot smaller than this, called chambers, right? And you get your trios, your duos, your quartets, your septets, your uh, uh, quintets and all that. Not symphonic works, not orchestral works, nothing that big. Smaller scope works for smaller halls. And that hasn't changed, but what will be changing this semester, or I always think like a professor, <laughs> this, this season, right, is the fact that we don't have quite as many 
classical names. We don't have as much Beethoven. We don't have as much Bach. We're doing what's called now genre straddling. It's postmodernism. We, we don't have any lines of demarcation. We're all going to be, you know, sort of artistically doffing uh, our hats at uh, Pharrell Williams, who's the eclectic god of music, one of them at least, right? Um, you know, it's, it's in 2000, almost 19, music is just, like Charlie Parker said, uh, you just do what you do and let the critics name it if they've got to. We just, we're interested in, you know, he said he, he likes to play clean and look for all the beautiful notes and, and, and kind of color them, you know? That's what we're doing. So other people will say, ooh, is it jazz? Is it classical? It's like, well, it's really neither one. It's just some music, man. Give it you a know, name, just, call it what you want. You know what I'm saying? Just <laughs> listen to it and hopefully tap your feet. But no, we're, we will hear some uh, uh, arrangements by me and a, an incredible, incredible special guest, that cello guy, Kermaine Booker, who I'm really over the moon to invite. We did some arrangements, you know, independently of one another. So you'll hear some Ray Fawn Williams, um, a beautiful hymn uh, for all the saints that I just, have, that's one of my arrangements. Then he's done uh, an arrangement of Pablo Casals' Song of the Birds. Uh, so that's like a more traditional thing. What else is he doing? He's doing Kaddish by, I think, Leonard Bernstein and some real surprises coming out. So we're just crossing genres, we're just doing whatever, because this guy, Kermaine Booker, is a composer, he's an arranger, he's a singer, he's a classical cellist, he does it all, he covers he covers the waterfront. And he's got 18,000 followers on, 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 on Instagram. He does a video and half a million people watch. I'm like, yeah, you, you need to come here, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, need to, I need to, you know, get inside your brain and stuff. But, no, man. He, Talk he, about he, that call <laughs> where, where you're going, hey, listen, uh, I got an idea. <laughs> uh, you know, I think, man, it was over. It was in May again. I was putting together my series. I said, Derek, what are you going to do? I said, man, it's time to just reach out to Cremaine Booker. And I had seen him at uh, an annual thing I go to in Detroit, and we met up. And he had some, you know, some things, some nice positive things to say about me. And, uh, and I remember saying, no, when I grow up, I want to be like you. <laughs> <laughs> And I sat down, I said, you know, I think it's time to invite Kermaine Booker down. And I, 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 I Facebook messaged him. You know, there's, there's any more, there's a hundred different ways you can get to people, right? Yeah. Text, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. And so I just did that. And uh, I remember, I think he sat on it for like a couple hours. Like, oh my God, I hope he's not too busy. <laughs> you know, three hours. And I was like, uh, would you like, he's like, of course. What do you, of course, I'd love to come. Yeah, don't, whatever. I don't even, you know, whatever. I, I don't even worry about money or whatnot. And he was all jazzed to come down. And then the very exciting thing to talk about was, what are we going to play? Because I know you can do anything. He goes, well, can I bring some electronics? I'm like, dude, you can bring whatever. You know, you can bring whatever. You might even force me to bring my synthesizer out of, out of my studio. Whatever you want to do, Kermaine, I'm here for you. We can make it happen. And I was so excited about that. And I put together the rest of my season, which is just as exciting. But then when I started putting the, the teasers out on, <laughs> on the public media, people were like, we want to fly in to see that. Like immediately, people are like, oh, you, really? The two of you guys together? And, you know, Brian, what's happening is people didn't know I did those things. They didn't know I was an arranger. They didn't know, you know, I'm going to say it here. I haven't said it. I, I do sing a little bit. But um, <laughs> I'm not going to be doing that at this yeah, I'm okay. not going to be okay. singing. I, I, not that I can't. I just, you know. But, but the point is there's a lot of stuff that's going to be going on. You mentioned something that um, as we were talking before the taping, as – as, as a baseball player, a guy that can do <laughs> anything, in, play infield, play outfield, even pitch if he has to, yeah. is, is a utility player. But when it comes to being a musician, yeah. talk to me a little bit about being that utility person. Oh, wow. So it's called selective marketing. If you have tasted any measure of success early in your career, and I, uh, you know, I was pretty talented young, so I got to do some really neat things and meet some really powerful people all through my career, uh, you have to be careful about how you market yourself. And so I really, I remember when I was a teenager, I wanted to be the best cellist in the world. Then I found out what music you had to learn to get there. I was like, what's, the set, <laughs> what's choice B? Because we're not going with that. But no, but um, forget it. Top 10. Uh, yeah, I mean, you put me in the top 300, I'll be fine. Because that's stuff I'm not doing. But, but um, I had to be careful about letting people know that I also was a bass player, that I also was an arranger. Mind you, Brian, from the time I was eight, I think I've, I've been arranging music. No, I've been arranging music longer than I've been playing the cello. I've been arranging music since I was four, and I've been playing the cello since I was eight, playing bass since I was nine or 10. 
uh, composing since I was in high school. But if I, you know, tell people I'm a composer and an arranger and a singer and a bassist, they're going to be like, well, which do you do well? Because there's not enough time in the day for you to practice all of those things. So, so I was very careful all during, you know, my, my, my teens and, and my 20s and most of my 30s. I didn't let it be known that I, that I did this stuff. But when I reached, you know, in my 40s, I started accepting gigs because the funny thing about bass players is everyone needs one, but nobody wants to pay us enough. Yeah. So I didn't want to let a lot of people know that I played. But when the high power jobs came through, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm a bass player, you know. And, and now I'm industry endorsed. I'm an artist for NS Design, which makes incredible basses. It's amazing. I'm, I'm so blessed to be able to do that. Uh, but in any event, the point is, you ha one has to be very careful in how they market themselves because they'll be seen as a charlatan. Um, However, in that postmodern time that we live in now, where you know uh, st different streams of revenue is w or, or what we want, yeah. it's kind of the nice thing to be able to say, "I do all of these things," and then you can call yourself a producer, right? Uh, and so, when you can have your own product, your own brand, your own sound, then it becomes neat that you kind of try to go in the whole Quincy Jones direction, who's like the god of musical arranging and composition and producing. Yeah. Well, for you to do what you do, it takes a lot of support. And with Florida being a, a great place to retire, yeah. I understand you picked up a drummer that's got <laughs> a, a laundry list of yeah, accomplishments, man. man. Marty Morell is just a godsend to Florida. He's originally, I think, if he's... I think he's from Jersey and lived in New York, but maybe I have it exactly backwards. But whatever it is, he's teaching at UCF uh, Orlando, and we're all fortunate in the, in the arts world to have Marty Morell here. This guy was the longest standing drummer for the Bill Evans trio. Bill Evans is one of the uh, quintessential names of the cool jazz movement. I mean, the, one, of the, one of the biggest names in jazz. He worked with Stan Getz, who was famous for his, of, amongst other things, famous for his rendition of uh, Girl from Ipanema. And he's, work, he's also a cla classically trained, so he worked with the Toronto Symphony. He's worked with everybody. And then there's names he, you know, he just kind of mentions when you're hanging out with him. Like, you worked with him, too? He worked with everybody <laughs> in music. And a couple of things, Brian. He, he came to, to be a drummer on one of uh, my seasons about two years ago. And then uh, I'll let you know. Don't talk about it a lot, but I've got a, I've got a recording I'm working on. I've got a recorded project. And <laughs> I had done some synthesized drums on something. And it sounded good, but it didn't sound real good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you I know said, how that goes over yeah, with drummers, yeah, right? And, yeah, 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 or anybody who's an aficionado. And I said, man, I was talking with Marty Morell about coming to do this September 7th thing that we're talking about. And I said, would you mind maybe listening to my stuff that I'm doing? Would you mind maybe playing a little few minutes? He's like, Derek, I'd be glad to work with you on your CD. I'm like, so I'm going to have Marty Morell on my CD. Phenomenal, man. I'm so over the moon about being able to work with this guy, but he's going to be joining us on September 7th. So what, we're, what that's going to look like, we got Cremaine Booker, that cello guy, who everyone should look up on social media, all the platforms. Uh, and then we've got um, four wonderful cellists from the Tampa Bay area. A lot of them are, are, are students, former students of my dear friend, dear, dear friend, Scott Kluxdahl, who for uh, decades has been the cello professor at USF. Phenomenal cellist, phenomenal, lovely individual. Some of his former students are going to be with us. Um, Jason Bontrager, who uh, uh, is a great keyboard player I met at a jazz hit uh, at, at Polk State. Uh, we're just going to have a lot of fun playing together. I'm going to spend the evening bouncing back from cello and bass. So I'm just going to be in, on cloud nine. Uh, and we've got Marty Morell on drums. So that's an ensemble to die for. And then the, the repertoire is phenomenal. I'm, I'm busting my knuckles. When I leave here, i got to go over to my office and finish my arrangements and email them out. And then Cremaine's coming with his stuff. And then he's bringing electronics. He's going to do one of his own tunes. I, I might faint before I come out on stage, man. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be ridiculous. It's going to be ridiculous. I, I, I'm going to need a trust just to pick up the names that you've been dropping. <laughs> hey, it's it, it's it's it's, I'm, it's nothing like this has ever happened before. I used to do crossover concerts. That's what we called them back then in the '90s in Houston. Uh, I would hire cellists from Rice University, and Rice was like the, the Juilliard of the, of the South. Um, uh, Southwest, and uh, we do what Florida's getting ready to hear now. But I have—I've only done this one other time, and you know, I hired great people, but they couldn't swing, and you know, you, they couldn't swing. You know, classical musicians yeah. are within a box. It's the day for getting outside the box. So this whole concert, this whole event, is way outside the box from beginning to end. I've got to ask you. Yeah. We got just a little bit of time left. How has social media? 
really helped you promote who you are, what you're doing, and, and reach out to others in, in this age? Because it, it used to seem like the music industry was, was in a box and yeah. you either were signed and did what they did right? and how they did it, or you didn't. Where now, yeah. you know, now y you can be your own yeah. distribution company. You yeah. can be your own. Talk to me a little bit so about that. So YouTube is a big thing, right? If you, get, if you go viral on YouTube, which is not easy at all, then you're a phenom. Uh, but there's also Facebook. I'm, I'm a bit of a cynic. I use social media in a, like, a self-deprecating way, so I put a lot of smart Alex <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of silly things up there. Then all of a sudden, I get really deep and pretentious. It's, it's ridiculous. Not you. But, yeah, not at all, right? Not me. <laughs> but the other thing you can do is that you can put snippets out and sound bites of your own stuff and tease people with it. Or if you like, you could put whole, uh, you know, of yours out there. But there's a, a, a software, a bit of software that people love to use, an app called Acapella. And I started looking at Facebook and Instagram. I'm like, all oh, these people are using Acapella. And some of them, Brian, are even good, but not all. Mm -hmm. So I said, y'all better hope that I never figure out how to do Acapella. When I do, it's game over. Yeah. So I, I still don't know how to use it, but I just turn my little iPhone towards myself in my studio, and I, I, I feel myself playing. And sometimes it's ridiculous stuff. I'm sitting down with my mom watching TV, and the idea to do something from the Jetsons will come up, and I'll run to my keyboard, and I'll film myself playing it. But yet, that led toward this project that I did, and I did a little teaser. I dropped some stuff on there, and people are like, oh, he's, he, he's actually serious. Oh, wow, yeah. So... You could really market yourself. You could tell them, hey, go to my YouTube channel, and then they check you out there. And, you know, if you've got 159,000 followers or whatnot, they know that you're something. I mean, uh, Childish Gambino's This Is America became a big deal because he did the video that went viral. And it's an amazing social commentary, social deconstruction. It's a scathing and on point one. Uh, but it wouldn't have been what it was if it had not had the video component on YouTube. So, yeah, everyone can be their own impresario or, 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 or handler now, right? You could, because all we want to do is hear your stuff. It's the age where people don't hardly even buy recordings. They download them. Yeah. So if you can't be a personality on social media, no one's going to care about you. So it's still equally as competitive. I would dare even say more so than the old-fashioned music industry. Uh, but it's an exciting and vibrant uh, time to be in, and I take advantage of it as much as I can. How do people find you? Uh, you can go to my website now, right, DerekMention.com. You can go to Polk State's website, and I'm active there for Voices of the People stuff. Uh, I'm on Instagram as one of my mom's nicknames, Fessasa. <laughs> <laughs> so you're Fessasa. So, you know, um, F-E-S-S-U-H-S-U-H or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I'm known on Instagram. Nice. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, uh, Derek mentioned on Facebook. But yeah, if you want a one-stop shop place, I'm um, still building it. But uh, there's enough stuff to get busy with on DerekMention.com, and you can find out about the latest stuff I'm doing. Yeah, always a pleasure to have hey, you man. in. My Next pleasure, time brother. you're bringing Daniel, right? Uh, John now. Oh, uh, I could bring Daniel, but I'm going to bring my new cello, John. Yeah, you know in I mean? case in case you're wondering at home, he's got two cellos. One's <laughs> Daniel. That's the first one he brought in. Yeah. Now John's the new one. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, next yeah. time I'm going to hold you too. You got to bring it in. All Absolutely. right. Absolutely, be my pleasure. And I guarantee you, I will be there on the seventh. I appreciate. Please it. do, brother. I appreciate you now. Thank Always you. Always a pleasure to have you in. Voices of the People founder Derek Mention invites you to Cello 2.0. Join them Friday, September 7th at 7 p.m. at Polk State Lakeland Campus, LTB Atrium. That's 3425 Winter Lake Road. They plan to present the cello in ways not often heard ever anywhere, unless Professor Mention or his very special guest, that cello guy, Cremaine Booker, make it happen. In a concert that will span and cross various genres, Mention and Booker, principal cellist in orchestras in Tennessee, and a composer and arranger and producer, and their musical guests will perform a few traditional works, plus also several works arranged by Booker and Mention. Now the cost for the event is just a suggested donation of $5, but it's gonna be worth a lot more than that. If you need more information, give them a call, 863-669-2928, or look them up on the web at DerekMention.com. Make sure you do not miss Cello 2.0.